So economic sociology is the sociological study of the economy. Um, and um, this means sort of being in dialogue with economics and how it is that economists understand the economy um, um, and providing an outline of what it is we think economic conditions are um, and how it is that the economy works. Now, you've been introduced to a little bit of this already um, uh, with a Marxian perspective on economic relations. So um, we spent some time talking about um, in previous lectures how Marx understood the economy as being the most important thing for any social community, that it determined a lot of social outcomes. Today, I'm really going to expand upon and transform that and move us beyond a Marxian framework to ask more generally, like, what do we mean when we talk about the economy? Um, um, and uh, this is going to hopefully feel pretty um, uh, resonant with other lectures that I've given to you guys so far. Because a big part of it is, is thinking about the economy not as something that's natural, but instead as something that's produced. And so again and again, across the series of lectures, what you'll still be talking about is thinking about the economy as a social construction, as something that different communities produce, um, and that they produce with a set of laws, um, with a set of informal expectations, and that those laws and formal expectations, et cetera, have consequences for the um, uh, 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 organization of, of economic relations. The economy is going to be the word that we use to describe how we make, buy, and sell things. So there's going to be sort of three central processes here. The process of production, how it is that we make things, and then the second process, the process of exchange, which means the process of buying and the process of selling. And the economy is important because of things like jobs, which don't just give us income or money to live on, they also give us a non-trivial amount of meaning. So um, if you ask yourself like, you know, what is it that you wanna do with your life? What is the job that you wanna have? It's not just a question of like what your paycheck is going to be. It's partially a question of who you are and how you want to conceptualize yourself. And this is more true for some workers than for others, but overall, work gives many of us meaning. So work gives us a sense of value or meaning in our lives. And so jobs are really important to understand what are the meaning-making possibilities for people. It's also really important for money, though, you know, and so jobs are important relative to the amount of money that you have, and it produces things like wealth and poverty. And so in the next series of lectures, we're gonna be thinking about what it means to, to ask like how an economy functions and what are the consequences for the different ways in which economies are organized. Economic sociology is the study of the social and institutional dimensions of economic behavior. So what is the social and institutional or organizational dimensions of economic behavior. So how is it that the organization of our communities influences economic behavior? And how does economic behavior influence our um, social institutions? So some questions that motivate economic sociologists that economic sociologists might ask is, why do some people get paid more than others? Um, may seem like an easy question to answer, but it turns out it's not at all easy to answer why it is that some people get paid more than others. It's not just a return to skill. Sometimes people get more paid more than others because they're men, not women, or because they're white and not uh, Latino. And so there's labor market discrimination. There are lots of reasons why some people get paid more than others. Why are corporations so common? So, the corporate form, the institutional form of a corporation has become a dominant form in our society. And we might ask, why? Why is that the case? And then what is it that markets do? You know, are they good or bad? Might be too simple, but like how do we understand the role of markets? Um, you know, to begin with, you might think about how the economy is a decentralized system of rewards. Um, so 
By decentralized system, what I mean is that it's not actually a system that is controlled absolutely by one person or group. Even in contexts of a managed economy where there is considerable intervention into the economy, the economy overall is fairly decentralized, that um, most people are not at all controlled by the state or maybe influenced by it, but that there's pretty big variation for that. And so in a, de in a decentralized system of rewards, it's important to ask why it is that some people get more rewards than others. Um, the second thing to think about is, are the sets of institutions that build and govern the economic world. And so we could ask, like, who makes dollar bills? And who puts them into circulation in the economy? And who put those people in charge? So <laughs> there are lots of institutions that are very important for the economy, like the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. And they have roles like controlling the money supply and controlling certain interest rates that are lend, that, that determine how banks lend to one another. Um, and that those have really important impacts. And those are institutions or organizations. So they're, they're, they're places that have a logic and a set of ideas of their own. And we might ask like, what, how did that come to be? And what is it that those things are doing, and what is the consequence of that? Now, the American economy currently is a capitalist economy, um, and most of the industrialized world has capitalist economies. Even in instances of um, managed economies, um, like the Chinese economy is primarily a capitalist economy. This means that risk and profit are mostly private. That they're not controlled by the state, that there's a relative degree of decentralization, that no single person or institution controls the entire system, and that um, uh, businesses are profit driven. That is, that most businesses have as their central aim the pursuit of profit. Um, so, in capitalist economies um, or market economies, um, uh, uh, free market economies, um, you see the privatization of risk and of profit, which is tied to the privatization of poverty, decentralization of rules of how it is that the economy is run, and a profit motive, or a motive to generate more profits within businesses. A major topic in economic sociology is this market or capitalist economy. People own property, they use money and resources to set up businesses, big and small, and losses and gains are usually private. The capitalist economy is a huge web of relationships, transactions, and legal rules. There is no central department of business that's responsible for running the capitalist economy. There may be organizations that help moderate the ways in which businesses work. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank is one, the Treasury is one, um, and then there may be anti-monopoly rules, et cetera, that help govern the economy or rule the economy. Um, but there's nothing really that organizes the whole thing. And in fact, it's too complicated to have one place organize the whole thing. Usually governments regulate rather than control economies. So the difference is regulations are a set of rules that all companies have to follow but they don't actually control particular businesses. Um, there are countries like Cuba and North Korea that are organized very, very differently than this. But for the most part, most countries in the world have some element of organization that looks basically like this. And the idea is that this exposes individuals to non-trivial risks, and that within this capitalist economy, that there have to be other institutions that help moderate that risk. Life in a capitalist economy is one where most people work in some sort of private organization, as small as a family restaurant and as big as a multi-billion or maybe even multi-trillion dollar corporation. So to be you know, thinking of Amazon as an example. That most businesses try to make a profit 
um, that the income from sales exceed the cost of businesses. So that their aim is not simply, is not to distribute all of their money to workers. Instead, it's to make profits and ideally to grow. And that this can be a difficult process, that there's money to be made, but people get laid off in the process and as businesses die and reduce costs and that people experience a non-trivial amount of risks and that there is likely significant degrees of inequality. Capitalist economies are wealthier overall, and so huge social gains have been made because of capitalist economies. Huge declines in human suffering are associated with capitalist economies, but there are also large degrees of inequality. Um, I want us to take a little bit of a step back here um, and just say that like, when we think about an economy, one way to think about it is the distribution of goods in a society. And that there are really three critical places where goods are distributed. And in this series of lectures, I'm gonna focus on one of those places, which is the economy. It's one place where goods are distributed. But there are two other critical places that distribute goods that in some ways work with and moderate the effects of the economy. The first is the family. The family is a central place where individuals distribute goods to other individuals. So, you know, you're listening along right now and chances are you're pretty young and almost everything you have, you didn't work. I mean, some of you maybe got jobs and uh, bought a bunch of your clothes and things, but most of the things that you've consumed in the course of your life, you did not work for, for most of you. It'll be a tiny, tiny proportion of you for whom that isn't true. So think about that for a moment. It's kind of astonishing. Like from the ages of zero to at least like 14, everything you consumed, you did not do anything. You didn't have a job that helped you consume that. You basically just took it from somebody else who provided it for you. Now, I'm not saying you're a leech or a terrible person, but I am pointing you to the huge roles that families play in the distribution of goods. That families are deeply involved in distributing goods between members of the family, either in terms of families providing for children, children providing for parents, family members providing for one another, the ways in which parents transfer assets to children over time um, or to other family members to help them out. One form of the distribution of goods in a society is the family. And the unit, and we'll have a series of lectures on the family, so don't worry, there's an entire section on the family where we'll talk a lot about this. So you should think about the family is a critical unit of distribution. So that's gonna be one thing. And families do things in response to capitalist economies. The second is the state. Um, and the state does a lot of resource distribution to people beyond the market. So um, the economy, um, is not just the market, but it's also, in some ways, like the state and the family. So the, 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 the state provides a lot of goods for people in order to facilitate things. Now, in some ways, this is like, you know, just think about roads and schools and sidewalks and electricity and things like that. And you may say, well, the electric company is private, but actually, as it turns out, if you look closely at the electric company, the state is deeply involved in that. And so lots of goods are distributed not by the economy, but by the state. The state also serves often as a safety net within life in a capitalist economy. So if you look at you know, life in a capitalist economy, this slide right now, and you think, most businesses are working to make profits and that this can be rocky because um, risks are distributed to individuals. One of the reasons that isn't catastrophic is because the, the, 
economic dimensions of capitalism is not the only place where goods get distributed within markets. The state gets involved and the state does things to help in contexts where people may be hurt by things that are happening in the economy. So, you know, think for example of what's been happening with the coronavirus. In the United States, the massive series of interventions um, by the state, one, these, pay, these checks that have just been written to the citizenry, um, to people who make less than a certain amount of money, less than, I think it's 100,000, who get, you know, I think it's $1,200 each, and then um, this supplementing of unemployment benefits by about $600. Um, it's a huge, huge set of interventions where the state is basically intervening. So when we think about the distribution of goods within a society, don't just think about capitalist markets as the only place that it happens. There's families and the state that are also deeply involved in this process. And they're deeply involved in part because they help moderate in some instances and aggravate in others the inequalities that markets produce. When people work in a capitalist economy, they generally work in different kinds of jobs that we describe as manual occupations, such as working class jobs, or more professional organizations in white collar jobs. Um, you see the difference in these work and occupations in most societies. Um, and the big point here is um, that manual labor is paid less and considered lower prestige or lower status. Um, and you know, there, there are some high paid um, um, manual labor jobs, plumbers come to mind, for example, but overall manual labor is seen as less valuable within a capitalist economy than other kinds of professional work. And um, um, there's been, there is this sort of like process of paying fewer, less to, to manual laborers than to others. And this is part of life in a capitalist economy. Importantly, and we've seen this um, in other lectures, but I return to it every single time, there are significant wage gaps between racial and ethnic groups in the United States. Um, and uh, this is a census chart that shows that whites and Asians um, make much more than African Americans and Latinos in the US. And, this is a trend that goes back decades. What we see is that um, the real median income by race um, shows that uh, you know, in 2014, Asian families made on average $77,200 a year. Whites made um, around $14,000 less than that, 63,000. Hispanic families made 45,000 on average and black families made 36,000 or nearly 37,000. What this shows is that Asian families make about twice as much as black families. And this is a huge, huge difference um, in um, uh, the racial wealth gap. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, the idea here is that social status is associated with income that your social position it could be in some way predictive of or associated with, at the very least, your income. And you know, when we look at this, we see how it is that um, uh, social structure influences wages and influences the economy. It's not just that like people enter into the economy as unsocialized beings, but things like the social construction of race, of gender, of region, um, are going to impact how much money it, it is that people make. There's also a significant wage gap between men and women. And this chart um, shows the comparison of women, different kinds of women to white men. And what you see is that Asian women earn 78% of white of what white men do. Uh, white women earn 82% of what white men do. Black women earn 65% of what white men do. And Hispanic women earn 58% of what white men do. This gap has 
shrunk a little since the 1980s, but not that much. And in fact, for um, Hispanic women, you see it hasn't really changed at all. This is a very common pattern that we see not only in the United States, but in other places, other countries as well. This points to an important gender wage gap, so that when looking at the economy, we don't just see the racial dimensions of the economic gap, but a gendered set of dimensions where women, um, either because of the social structure of the communities that they're from, and also, so I shouldn't say either, I should say women, in part because of the social structures of the communities that they're from, as well as a range of other factors, are far less likely um, uh, to earn um, as much as men. Some of this is a product, I will assert, of labor market discrimination. Some of this is uh, explained by different sets of skills and opportunities that are afforded. But no matter what, you see that Hispanic women make 58 cents on the dollars compared to white men. And that is a huge racial wealth gap um, that has large consequences socially um, for us. Now, for these, we might identify three possible answers for income gaps. The first is human capital, the second is discrimination, the third is selection. Human capital is the idea that people have different skills and that the reason that there's racial or gender wage gaps within the United States and more broadly across the world is that people by, a, by race and gender have different skills and that those are rewarded on labor markets and that's why we find Discrimination is that employers choose to pay certain people from certain racial and ethnic backgrounds less. Selection is the idea of um, sorting uh, into different kinds of jobs. So this would be the idea that like, you know, maybe women are just choosing different kinds of jobs than men. And that's why, um, uh, uh, um, they're earning less. So what, what would this exp explanation look like? Well, it would look something like this. You know, women are more likely to have children that they're responsible for on a regular basis than men. That is a gendered assumption about the organization of the world, but it tends to be a fairly persistent one. And insofar as they are, they need different kinds of jobs than men. They need jobs that allow them to do things like be done with work at 3.30 so that they can go pick up their kids from school. They need to be not working on the weekend in order to take care of children. Again, I'll emphasize this is in part based upon a gendered assumption that women have to do more of the child rearing than men. And that is, in fact, a persistent assumption across many societies. Women do far more household labor than men do. But I would say that, like, the jobs that women are choosing because of this are lower paying, and that's what's explaining this. It's not discrimination. Um, overall, uh, you know, um, your income is certainly based upon your skill set. Um, not exclusively, but it's highly predictive. And this is an idea of human capital theory. And it's pretty simple that in school and elsewhere you acquire skills, and that in labor markets, people pay workers for the right set of skills or the people who have more skills. And that wage gaps emerge because some people either don't have skills or don't have skills that are in demand. Um, now, some of these skills you could think of as genetic or innate, um, and some of these skills we could think of as developed, some of them we can think of as happening in dialogue with one another. So um, maybe people have different levels of intelligence. Those different levels of intelligence can be converted um, through training into skills. They could also help people function um, on at different levels. And that some of your income is going to be based on this. Um, some non-trivial portion of your income is going to be based on that. And so um, we may find that different groups have different sets of human capital. This is a pretty hard argument to make, um, I'll just say, uh, because it suggests that like racial groups are inherently smarter or dumber than one another, or that men are inherently more skilled than women are. And I personally find those types of arguments pretty untenable. Um, uh, but it's important to note that like 
they human capital may not explain much of the racial or gender wealth gap, but it may explain some of it because of different levels of education experienced, for example, by different racial and ethnic groups, which leads to different levels of skill. And um, that overall, if, you, if you're not looking at gaps, that actually skill development is really important for wages overall. We see, importantly, a college premium in um, uh, social life and that um, people make more from having gone to college significantly. And that human capital theory claims that the gap is due to the fact that high school graduates have fewer high demand skills than college graduates. And so, you know, you could ask yourself, is this true? Is it true that people in college are getting a greater number of skills? You're sitting here listening to me right now, like, is this actually skill development that's happening within you? Maybe, maybe what I'm providing you with is a set of conceptual tools that could be useful, a way of analytically parsing out problems that might be helpful in order to divide them into constituent elements. I'm gonna stop here on this lecture, and then in the next lecture, we're gonna pick up other reasons for why it is that there are differences um, uh, 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 between um, different groups. I want to end though by um, um, reminding you that like, you know, part of what's happening is um, that the difference uh, in wages is partially a difference also in, in investment, um, that there are different levels of investment that are being placed into different students and that those are coming with a range of labor market rules. So I'll stop here. And then in the next set of lectures, we'll talk about other explanations for wage gaps within an economy.